I've written a brief paper on the Jewish feast of Shavuot, that's the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost in Greek, and how it relates to the speaking in tongues of Acts chapter 2. There are three interpretations of uh, Acts chapter 2, the tongues there. The first interpretation is that they were speaking various pagan languages. God somehow inspired the early Christian church to speak in all these different pagan languages. Why God would do that? The second opinion is that uh, it was an ecstatic babble. So they were just, uh, la la basho, la 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 la, they were just babbling as many people uh, do in uh, various uh, groups today. The third view is a very interesting view advocated by Robert Zahusen that the Jews had a Greek and Aramaic as their natural tongue and Hebrew as the language for the temple and the synagogue. And in Acts chapter 2 on this um, famous Jewish feast of weeks, what actually happened was that they were in the temple precinct and God was inspiring them to speak in the normal languages of Aramaic and Hebrew within the temple confines rather than the rather than Hebrew. Anyway, here's my paper which I'll expand upon as we as we read through it. The annual Jewish Feast of Weeks celebrated God giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. In Greek this festival is called Pentecost, which means fifty. So the background for the languages of Acts chapter two, verses seven to eleven, is the Pacific annual Jewish feast which celebrated the giving of the law, and of course this law was written in Hebrew, to Moses. The location is almost certainly the temple precinct, for they were in the company of thousands of people. Acts 2.41 says that 3,000 people were converted, so if 3,000 were converted, maybe there were five or 10 or 15,000 who weren't converted. You're not going to meet that many people on a Jewish marketplace or in a, the equivalent of a Jewish tavern. The only place you're going to meet that many people in Jerusalem on the Feast of Weeks would be the temple. Also notice that this was the time of the first prayer, that's nine o'clock in the morning, we find that at Acts 2.15, and because this is the Jewish Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, I hope I pronounced that correctly, I, I don't speak Hebrew, Therefore, that fixes the location as the temple precinct. The outer precinct of the temple, where of course men and women were kept separate, and um, it was the time of the first prayer. Now, what better sign could there be than God now was now supernaturally giving the Holy Spirit to the church on the day of Pentecost? than inspiring his apostles to preach boldly in Aramaic and Greek rather than in Hebrew. In doing so, God was directly overruling the temple customs and therefore signifying that he had finished with the temple and its entire system of sacrifices. So the Aramaic and Greek languages announced the gospel and signified that there is now a new way to God through Jesus Christ Therefore, the temple is obsolete. Of course, the temple wasn't destroyed for approximately another 40 years in AD 70. Also, bear in mind that in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we read, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts 1 8. So God prophesies that the gospel message will be taken from Jerusalem, it will expand to Samaria where there were um, uh, people who were considered to be partial Jews or half Jews, the Samarians, and then it will go to the ends of the earth, in other words to people who are Gentiles. Now what better sign could God give to signify the fulfillment of this prophecy, or rather the start of the fulfillment of this prophecy, than the gift of speaking in the languages of the people to whom the apostles are going to be sent to. Therefore, that is why the miracle of Acts chapter 2, in my opinion, is God inspiring the apostles to speak in the languages of 
Aramaic and Greek rather than Hebrew to facilitate the taking of the gospel beyond the Jews, beyond Judea, beyond Samaria, to the utmost end of the earth, to Gentiles such as myself. You see, I don't speak Hebrew. I speak very, very, very little Greek. Now, if the gospel is in Hebrew, I'm not going to be saved because I can't understand Hebrew. And that is why I believe this miracle in Acts chapter 2 was God taking the gospel message and using it in the vernacular language, not the high Hebrew of the temple, not what the Jews regard as the holy language of Hebrew, but the secular language. I'm going to continue. Robert Zahusen has pointed out that the Jewish culture in the first century was diaglossic, which means that they spoke in two or three languages. Aramaic was the common or secular language for most of the Jews worldwide, but many would also have spoken Greek as well, and certainly those from Crete and Asia, that's Asia Minor, which is in Turkey, where Greek was the official language, because of course modern day Turkey was conquered by Alexander the Great and he made them all speak Greek. But these Jews also had a higher, a spiritual language that was Hebrew which was reserved for the synagogue and the temple. So the miracle in Acts chapter 2, verse 7 to 11, wasn't their ability to babble mindlessly as the pagans in trances did, and which many pagans in trances still do today, or even to speak in the pagan languages of the pagan cultures from which they came. God forbids his people from learning the ways of the heathen, Deuteronomy 18, 9. And speaking a pagan language would be the first step step to adopting their pagan culture. The apostles spoke to the crowd in Aramaic and Greek therefore, which was the natural tongue tongues of their Jewish hearers, Acts 2.8. But seeing that the apostles were not Levitical priests, and that they were within the temple precinct where only Hebrew was permitted, therefore the Holy Spirit's miracle was to inspire them to preach the gospel boldly in Aramaic and Greek as a sign that following the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that now the Jewish temple and its bloody sacrifices, represented by the Hebrew tongue, has been replaced by the gospel, which is represented by the Greek and Aramaic vernacular tongues, the common tongues of the common people. Pentecostals cannot explain how the apostles, being Galileans, therefore Aramaic speakers themselves, could have spoken in Aramaic, i.e. to those from Judea in Acts 2.9, who were also Aramaic speakers, and yet this was somehow a miracle. For there is absolutely nothing miraculous about people speaking in a language with which both the hearer and the speaker fully understands. Think of me speaking to you in English through, through, through this camera. If you are a natural English speaker, that's your natural language, and you're hearing me in English, your natural language, and I'm speaking it in, in English, my natural language, how can that be a miracle? It's not a miracle, it's just natural. Yet Acts chapter 2 verse 9 mentions Judea. It says that one of the uh, groups of people came from Judea, where Aramaic was the natural tongue. So people who are Pentecostals need to explain how could God be giving a supernatural miracle to speak in the language of the people from Judea, which is Aramaic, when both the speakers, the apostles on the day of Pentecost, and the hearers were both Aramaic. 